Odessa over here because I'm a member of both and was actually a board member with Brian uh, on uh, the BTA. And I'll admit this out loud so that a lot of people probably don't know this about me, but I previously testified before Mr. Wallace before I worked for TriMet in support of putting the bike racks on the buses. So I am one of those people who is responsible for them on the buses, and I'm glad they're on there. <laughs> it is. I had a couple items I want to mention, and I was a little reluctant uh, seeing kind of the focus on this for safety, but not really for an overall system uh, problem. But the one thing that really totally bugs me about this, and I come from this with a 30 year previous experience being a commercial and a military pilot and working for Evergreen Airlines for just a little bit, fighting forest fires. Our dispatch system here doesn't really work as a dispatch system. It works as a glorified lost person um, adjunct to the scheduling department to look for extra bodies to fill in for the next day or later on in the afternoon. It does a fairly good job if you've broken your bus down or you've been involved in an accident, but if there is a major traffic disruption or a giant snowstorm, the message goes out, don't call us, there's a big problem, figure it out on your own. This last snowstorm we had, I was stuck in Tualatin and I was forced to figure out with another driver with a smartphone, calling my wife, having her watch TV, listen to the AM radio, the little transistor I've got in my pocket to try to figure out what was going on, because dispatch abandoned us. And so I got stuck in Lake Oswego for about five hours until I could finally see on TV where it was safe for me to go home. There was no business for me to be attempting to drive through Mountain Park on Boone's Ferry where all the other buses got trapped, all the cars got trapped. Dispatch has the capability to manage it like an airplane dispatcher does. Otherwise, you're just letting drivers go out there with a $300,000 plus bus, battering ram, fill in the blank, whatever you want, to just go out on the public roads and just have at it. That's not smart. You wouldn't let somebody in an airplane do that. It would be the equivalent if there was a snowstorm in Portland International and they just said, the tower just said, gosh, it's just too tough for us to manage, figure it out on your own. And all of a sudden, you have an operative ATC system that works like a clock replaced by a bunch of bush pilots out there. Now, the problem is, you just don't have a couple of people flying around out there. You've got airplanes full of people like we have buses full of people. And I was embarrassed to tell the people on my buses that I didn't have any information. They were giving me information. They had the radios on. They went to their iPods, they went to their computers and their Wi-Fi, and they were giving me information. What would you think if you were on an airplane and you were given the pilot information? You'd say, help me please, put this on the ground, I want to get off. That's exactly what you'd say. So think about that. Because what you're going to have is a situation where it's going to be like a squirrel. He runs out in the middle of the road and he stands up and he's all of eight inches tall and he's trying to make a decision. Is there something coming after me in that other lane? Can I go the rest of the way across? He doesn't know. He can't see around the corner. And that's what we as bus drivers were attempting to do during that storm or any other event that causes the roads to be broken down. There's a system right now on TriNet where I can go there and I can look at the whole system and see where the buses are all jammed up. Dispatch has that available to them too. Break the system into four quadrants or four, five, whatever, so that a dispatcher can sit there and look at Sandy Boulevard and say, my God, why do we have 10 buses all going to Gresham and they're all within a minute of each other, but nobody's coming back? I can split that in half. Five of them go one way, five the other, the two in the back, take a nice long 20 minute break, get some hot chocolate, and then bus number four, you take off at this time, and bus number five, you take off at this time. We're all going 25 miles an hour or less, and you spread them all out, and you manage. You actually manage. The other system, uh, part of the system that really kind of frustrates me is we eliminated a little publication internally called the Operator's Report. It was really pretty good piece of document from 
training department that brought up issues that needed to be re-emphasized, such as the schools are going to now be back in service in September. Everybody heads up. You know, the kids are going to be running around. It's daylight savings time. Things are going to happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just kind of refreshes everybody's memory on this. Well, one of the things that did in there at one time is they published a complete listing of this one part of the traffic code. And it involves the use of the four-way flasher when you're on a public street. And I know this gentleman from UPS follows this, and I don't have anybody here from the post office. I know they follow it, but we don't. We stop on a travel lane and we put the right turn signal on. Well, Joe Schmo behind you figures you're going to make a right turn. And you're making a right turn, you're making a right turn, and then you don't make a right turn. And so he goes nuts because he doesn't know what you're doing. If he pulls up behind a garbage truck, a postal vehicle, or a UPS vehicle, and they have their four-way flashers on, he knows that vehicle is stopped and blocking traffic. It's doing business. Not a, not a big rocket science item here. But we in our training department are stuck in the old transit mall mode. We don't even use now where when you're at the curb, you have a right turn signal on. When you're ready to leave, you put your left turn signal on, everybody stops and yields. Well, that's not how the new transit mall works. So let's read the traffic code and let's start doing that. There are a lot of us, me included, I'll raise my hand, you can send the supervisor after me for not following the SOPs, but people don't run into the back of my bus when I have the four-way flashers on because they know I'm stopped. And if they choose to go around me, that's their choice. I can't make that. We got the yield light when I'm ready to leave. I put the yield light on, the left turn signal, I move on out in traffic. The last item I'd like to mention is the newest buses we have, the 2900s. You've heard a litany about the uh, reflectorized light on the inside, which I think is a real abomination and the solution to turning the lights off inside. I, I couldn't believe anyone would put pen to paper and actually suggest that we do that. That's absurd. But even more so, there's some real flaws in whoever managed the contract to buy this bus in terms of following it through. I had the great opportunity to actually have a trainer take me out the first day I was given one so I could kind of figure out how it worked. And then I got a copy of the owner's manual and I was able to read that and actually understand how some of the systems on it work. But the big thing is, and I, I got some really strange answers on this. The exit windows on the bus are windows that are hinged to the top and you release them and they pivot out so the bus is on its side or somehow or other blocked so you can't get out, you can swing the windows out. One of those windows is the window right behind the driver's seat that is blocked to get to it by the electronics compartment in the bus. On the exact opposite side of the bus, where the main door is, it's where the wheel well is, it's where the garbage cans and some of the emergency uh, triangles are, that window is not a window that you can swing out. There is nothing in there blocking it. And I and my ability to try to fix things Took a tape measure out them one day. They're identical, identically sized openings. It would seem to me that it would probably take a very adept mechanic, not real long, to pop both those windows out, walk them around the bus, reinstall them, and now you've got it where it's supposed to be. But the real crowning jewel in how badly this bus has been integrated in the system is the paper towel dispenser. It's tucked behind the driver's head, so when a passenger wants to get one, it scared the bejesus out of me one day when some guy came. I didn't know if I was being assaulted or if he just liked my hair or if he was going after my backpack. I mean, two or three. Put, yeah, put this thing where the passengers can see it and get access to it. They don't have to futz with the driver while he's driving. Anyway, I'll stop my hurrying there. Any questions I can answer anybody? Questions for me? Thank you very much for having us. Thank you.